Hello, and welcome to this worldwide devotional for young adults. We are broadcasting from the Burns Arena on the campus of Utah Tech University in St. George, Utah. I am Elder Michael S. Wilstead in Area 70. Thank you for joining us in this devotional with Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Sister Patricia T. Holland as our speakers. They inspire us with their examples, tireless service, and commitment to the Lord. We love them, and we look forward to their messages. We want to acknowledge Richard B. Williams, president of Utah Tech University, and his wife Kristen on the stand with us. We thank the university for sharing its facility and resources with us. We're also grateful to be joined on the stand by Elder Clark G. Gilbert of the 70, who serves as the Commissioner of Church Educational Systems, and his wife Christine, and Brother Chad H. Webb, Administrator of Seminaries and Institute, and his wife Christy. I'm also pleased to be joined by my, with my wife, Denise. We also thank local church leaders, university leaders, and administrators of seminary and institute for being with us today. A choir of young adults from the St. George area will sing Redeemer of Israel as our opening song. They will be led by Marshall McConkie and accompanied by Quint Bronco and Dallin Taysom. Following the hymn, Janessa Houston from the St. George, Utah YSA Second Stake will offer the opening prayer.
Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be here, gathered together to hear thy word and to learn from the Spirit. We're grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ, in our life and his active role that he plays. We ask thee at this time to please bless each one of us with an added measure of the Spirit that we may learn of thee and thy Son, Jesus, that we may receive impressions and promptings that we have been seeking, that we may recognize answers given. Please also bless us today with the courage to act upon the impressions and promptings that we receive and that we might go from this place and, and act on them. We're grateful for all that thou has given us, Heavenly Father, and especially those things that we do not see. Help us to recognize thy hand daily, and we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for the beautiful music and wonderful prayer. We will first hear a musical number by the Young Adult Choir. They will sing Joseph Smith's first prayer. They'll be led by Marshall McConkie and accompanied by Quint Baranco. Following the choir, we'll be blessed to hear from Elder and Sister Holland. After Elder Holland's message, the congregation will sing hymn number 131, More Holiness Give Me. Tyler Shumway of the St. George, Utah YSA Second Stake will offer the closing prayer.
thank you for that choir number. I love the hymn, and I love that arrangement, and I love you. Well, our dear young friends everywhere, how privileged Sister Holland and I are to be with you tonight. Even though we're reaching most of you around the world through the modern wonder of technology, we're delighted to have a personal audience here at this university and its Institute of Religion, where Pat and I started our college education, dated, and got married. I'm waiting to see if a chill went through the room <laughs> when I said the word marriage. Don't panic. We are not going to talk about marriage tonight. Some of you already are, and we don't want the rest of you to run screaming from the room. <laughs> but I do mention our own young adult roots and romantic beginnings with the thought in mind that if it struck us on a night like this, who knows? <laughs> Might strike others. <laughs> Certainly plenty of you sisters have told us that there are some men who need to be struck. <laughs> if not with Cupid's arrow, then perhaps a small pickleball paddle. If there is any young woman out there tonight seated with a young man who fits this description, Elder and Sister Holland give you permission to elbow him <laughs> in the ribs right now, right this minute, gently enough to convey love, sharply enough to make the point. We will be happy if such a nudge works for you the way it worked for us, except in our case it was my elbow and Sister Holland's ribs. <laughs> this coming June, it will be 60 years ago that Pat and I were married in the St. George Temple, just a half a mile from this university campus. I've told some of you of the difficulty that I had in that courtship. I knew I had my work cut out for me when on our first date, I knock at the door. Her little brother answers the door, sizes me up and down, and then calls out, hey, dreamboat. Your barnacle's here. <laughs> I fought my way up from that. <laughs> I, it didn't help when later in the night, the very first date, she's being very courteous and sweet. We hadn't been out long into the evening, and she said, Well, Jeff, uh, tell me your dreams. And I said, well, one was that I was in a cave, <laughs> and there were some snakes and spiders, and, and, and then I thought a force in the back, a kind of a scary thing. It was later that I understood she meant my goals in life. <laughs> but let me just say to the men in the room, and this is important. A marriage is a great continuing relationship of conversation and convictions and opinions. And in those conversations and convictions and opinions, one person is right, and the other person is called a husband. <laughs> If you can get that down early, brethren, it'll just make life a lot smoother. Well, 
My apologies to the translators. I have no idea what they are doing with that. In <laughs> Can you imagine those poor people in France saying, what did he say? <laughs> well, to be serious, this is the start of a new year. And if you're feeling like the rest of us, it is a welcome chance to say goodbye to a period that's been difficult for many and tragic for some. We're gradually coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, but this plague of almost biblical proportions is still very real in many parts of the world, as there is still an average of over 1,700 reported deaths from this illness daily yet. This scourge has taken a toll not only on physical health, but also on the social, political, and economic life of almost everyone on the planet, one way or the other. A different kind of scourge is the one still unfolding in Eastern Europe, where millions of people, including members of the Church, have been devastated, displaced, or have given their very lives in a conflict they did not ask for and did not deserve. Just weeks ago, while on an assignment in Europe, Sister Holland and I met with some of those Ukrainian refugees. We laughed and cried and prayed with those who'd left everything behind and fled with only the clothing on their backs. We felt the same emotion and sorrow for our faithful members inside Russia who are also innocently affected by this conflict. In addition to these tragedies, in many places throughout the world, we see mass shootings, a tragedy just last week here in southern Utah, immoral content in entertainment, political activity in which such fundamental principles as integrity and kindness and honesty seem to have been somehow forgotten. And of course, there are many other cultural and social issues that trouble us. But we haven't come tonight to depress you with the world's problems. In fact, we have come for just the opposite reason. We recognize the understandable malaise that hangs over your generation. And we apologize that our generation has not resolved some of these problems that you now face. But we call you and every other young Latter-day Saint to be in the forefront of the moral force that can resolve these problems, that can turn back the tide of fear and pessimism and anxiety surrounding us. How important it is for you to pray not only for the Lord to prevail in your lives, as President Russell M. Nelson has asked, but also to pray that the values of your life will prevail with others who aren't quite so sure yet. If as individual disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were all more loving and peaceful and kind if we would all try to keep the commandments of God as best we can, then we have every reason to feel confident about the world's condition and our own. Walking into the future this way, filled with peace and godly promise, we could have an absolutely stunning impact on the world. Abraham Lincoln said once that he tried simply to pluck a weed and plant a flower in its place every chance he got. If we all did that, our moral and spiritual deserts would be veritable gardens in no time. Those of you out there in Germany tonight, where so much Christian hospitality is being shown to those Ukrainian refugees that we just met, you will recognize this saying attributed to Johann Goethe, who said, 
if every man swept in front of his own doorstep, the whole world would soon be clean. So recognizing the challenges and wanting to offer a way to address them, Sister Holland and I come tonight, as the Apostle Peter said we should, ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in us. We're going to talk about hope with the declaration that we must never lose it or its sister virtues, faith and charity. We realize there are lots of ways to define these closely linked principles, and you'll hear us offer a few of our definitions tonight. You'll also hear us declare with Moroni that hope is essential if we are, and I quote, to receive the inheritance God has prepared for you. We want you to claim that inheritance as sons and daughters of a king. To do that, we must realize that hope is not just the message and the manner of the naturally optimistic. It is the privilege of everyone who believes. And as a believer who is absolutely filled with hope and with faith and with charity, Sister Holland feels so strongly the importance of this worldwide congregation tonight and what your role is to be in the days that lie ahead. She knows you are the group to whom we pass the baton and feels it is essential that you step up and embrace your destiny. Sister Holland. I do feel so strongly about you. You are the strongest, the most righteous generation of young adults that, that the world has ever known. And I love you for that. Elder Holland and I are so grateful that you keep your covenants and that you strive to do what's right. And because there's so many of you, you will have that power that Elder Holland spoke about. You, I see a light in this room, and it's so bright. And it makes me think about this when the Savior appeared in 3 Nephi. He said, hold up your light, that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up. Elder Holland and I are so honored to be with you and humbled to be of such strength and righteousness. And we've prayed that you might benefit from some of our experiences in an earlier time. Like you, we were young ones, but now we have grown old. As I look back at my life, and if I could leave, live any part of it over again, I would do one thing differently, very differently, simplify. It seems to me that everything is better when it is simplified. Our food, our clothing, our furnishings, and our schedules. What I regret most is that in my youth, I didn't see the simple beauty of the gospel. I even made the gospel too complex. I felt it was too overwhelming, too difficult, and sometimes too mysterious. It seems to me that even as a young adult, I had to climb a mountain of righteousness go through a fiery furnace of purification and unravel every doctrinal controversy known to mankind. I, 
thought I had to do all these things to be acceptable before God. But there again, I was making it too complicated. And needless to say, my thinking then was more than a little girl from Southern Utah felt she could tackle. It was, as someone once said, the reason people do not join with you Christians is because you, you wear your religion like a headache, like a crown of thorns. There is only one person who has had to bear that crown of thorns, and he did it so that we might live joyfully, abundantly, and peacefully, not despairingly. The gospel was never meant to be a mountain that mountain that little girl felt like she could climb. He wanted her and everyone else in the world to always be filled with hope. He wants us to know that the gospel is beautifully simple and simply beautiful. But please don't misunderstand me in speaking of hope I do not mean that Christ should give us a magical wand or a modern lightsaber. Our hope has to be more than Pinocchio's when you wish upon a star, if it is to be the kind of hope the Savior taught. But brothers and sisters, my young brothers and sisters, it is a gift to us and to the entire human family that we have been blessed with hope. And we should recognize it as a light shining in a very dark world. As one writer said, none are completely wretched except those who are living without hope. The sweet simplicity involved in discovering this gift of hope is that you don't have to search for it. You don't have to run around chasing after it. You don't and you can't manufacture it. Like so much in the realm of grace, you won't acquire it by leaning on your own strength or on that of another person. There are no secret formulas nor any magical mantras involved. It won't come from deep breathing exercises, valuable as they are, nor by reading another book on how to be happy. In fact, the part that we play in this gift that is given is so important, is so important that our Heavenly Father has us live. We just bring a small part to it. He has the larger portion of the task. Our part to come to Him in lowliness and simplicity. And then we should worry not and fear not. Why so simple? Because behind everything Christ taught, in every scripture, story, and parable is the promise that with God all things are possible. The promise that God's power can wipe away every tear. We are to let go of personal desperation and seek rest in the Lord. So we come before Him with meekness and lowliness of heart to receive the blessings that come with His unceasing love. Our trust is to be like that of a little child or a little lamb, which actually we are in His grand flock. Our hearts will always be restless until they rest in God. This call to be meek and lowly of heart. One of the few descriptions the Lord gave 
about himself was that he was meek and lowly of heart. And it is a call to all of us as his disciples. If we can live this way, he says we will find rest to our souls and we'll discover that his yoke is easy, that his burden is light. I see this call to be meek and loneliness and lowly again and again as I read the scriptures. It's probably because I need it again and again. I'm sure that nothing of great spiritual consequence has ever been done by anyone who wasn't hopeful and humble. This kind of mindset is our hope for you tonight to have you learn this while you are still young. We want you to know with all of our hearts that God is your Father that he has carried you from the womb, that he has plans for you, plans for a future with hope. Let me share with you two scriptures I love in the Old Testament that uses some of this very same language. Isaiah says, hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all of the house of Israel which are born of me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. Even to your old age, and even when you turn gray, will I carry you, I have made, and I will bear. I will carry, and I will deliver you. And Jeremiah writes, for surely I know the plans I have made for you, plans to have you to, to, for your welfare and not for your destruction, for your harm, to give you a future with hope. And then when you call upon me and pray to me, I will hear you. I testify to you, my young brothers and sisters, that this is a truth born of my own personal experience, that our Heavenly Father will do His part in fulfilling these promises. It is up to us to simply believe. Believe simply to be more childlike in our meekness and especially in our gratitude as we receive His gifts. Do you want a really wonderful year this year? Do you want a future filled with hope? Do you believe there are blessings in store for you? Have you seen enough of God's goodness to hope on and to reach up? The irony will be that this is done by kneeling down by bowing, even perhaps by falling down at the feet of God. Such sweet simplicity, neatly bowing, falling at the throne of grace. Elder Holland indicated, indicated to you that we will find this precious gift of hope linked with two other gifts of God that of faith, and that of charity. Please do not do as I did when I was younger and make these virtues so huge and so complex that we feel despair trying to understand them. Cherish their simplicity. I offer you this one simple little sequence. Faith is the conviction that there is a God. Hope is trusting he will help us. And charity is his love working through us to bless others. 
I have learned regarding charity that none of us have the energy, the time, resources, or strength to do all that our hearts would like us to do. We cannot do it our, all. Our hearts do exceed our capacity. How wonderful it is that God's power moving through us can enlarge our, our modest impact can multiply our limited efforts and do for others that which we could never do alone. This simple approach to these three large doctrinal issues has blessed my life. I wish I could have seen them in this less intimidating way so much sooner. I firmly believe that God intended such gospel truths to be plain enough for even a child to understand. And I repeat it, faith is the conviction that there is a God. Hope is trusting that he will help us, and charity is his love working through us. While I speak of gifts from God, may I add one more gift that adds to our hope in this new year. Illuminating faith, hope, and charity is the unspeakable, unspeakably beautiful, and unspeakably simple gift of the light of Christ. This light so closely linked to hope is a gift given to every man, woman, and child who has ever been or will ever be born into mortality. It's embedded in our very natures. It is part of our very souls. One of my favorite scriptural passages includes this line. And the Spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world, and the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world. This light, there are so many of you that if you hold up your light, as the Savior said, and shine it throughout the world, you will realize that you're holding up the Savior, as he said, I am the light which you should hold up. That very light is one of the fundamental reasons for hope in our lives. It is so encouraging, so exciting, and just so hopeful that there is something within us that not only tells us that there is a right way to get through life's complexity, but it also tells us that we will find that right way if we are meek and lowly of heart. As President Nelson said to the entire church just a week ago, the world needs the light of Christ. Jesus Christ, and the world desperately needs your beautiful light. My wonderful young friends, my most earnest prayer tonight, my hope is that you, all of you young adults all over the world, will receive this call as your personal ministry, that you will take the hope of which the Savior spoke, and carry it like a torch to those who feel the world is very dark and a very difficult place. Is there any way I can encourage you to see that the bearing of this light is to be your latter-day ministry? Please, please understand this is the most important thing I feel like I have to say to you tonight. And my greatest fear is that I will not say it well enough 
for you really to believe me. You must bear this light in such a way that all the darkness in the world will never extinguish it. The simple but powerful approach to what are otherwise large and complex issues will change the trajectory of a falling, darkened world. Please have faith in God. Hope that he will help you and receive the charity that enables him to work through you to accomplish what only you can do. As you accept this challenge and begin this new year, after you have looked inward, I plead with you to look upward. The eyes that look down on yours will be those of a loving Father in heaven who can and will bestow upon you all those things you hope for in righteousness. You can't get these blessings by chasing them. Please stop running to the point of exhaustion. Be quiet. Be still. Simplify. Be meek and lowly of heart and pray. And I testify to you that miracles will come when we slow down, when we calm down, and when we kneel down. All that the Father has can one day be yours. What a truly, truly hopeful way to face your future. I love you very much. I admire you, and I will always pray for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Sister Holland, <clears throat> not only for teaching the gospel, but for living it. And for being filled with the hope of Christ that is in you. In our most difficult days, and in six decades of marriage, you can have some. Sister Holland has lived as she has taught. She has always been a believer. She has always trusted the eternal light within her soul. She has always lived with the certainty that God would hear our prayers and show us the way even if the night did seem dark. In a world that sometimes seemed overwhelming to a young couple, the truths and promises of the gospel were often all we had to hold on to. But that was enough, because here we are tonight, having received more blessings in our nearly 60 years of marriage than we ever could have dreamed possible. So, as this beautiful woman says, and has done, please hope on, pray always, and be believing. I add to Sister Holland's counsel the scriptural encouragement to face the future as cheerfully as possible. Someone wrote once, that of all the encouragement Christ extends to us in the scriptures, of all the hope he repeatedly offers to us, that which we repeatedly fail to accept is the encouragement to be of good cheer. May we please take Christ at his word in that regard. Could we just try it? May we embrace that happy, hope-filled invitation tonight as we seize yet another chance to start a new year and make of our life exactly what we want it to be. 
as with all of his invitations to us, Christ lived them before he taught them. In spite of the burdens that he bore, he was optimistic, positive, and helped others to be the same, including, I might add, prophets of God. From the depths of Liberty Jail and the depths of despair he experienced there, the prophet Joseph Smith's ultimate counsel to the saints who were outside praying for his release was, and I quote, to cheerfully, to cheerfully do all things that lie in our power, and then may we stand still with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed, close quote. And no one, I'm telling you, no one is more positive more optimistic, more filled with hope than Russell Marion Nelson, our living prophet, who echoed Joseph's counsel when he said to us recently, no spiritual blessing will be, held, will be withheld from the righteous. The Lord would have us look to the future with joyful anticipation. Prophets are of good cheer because they are true disciples of Jesus Christ, and that is the ultimate source of all optimism. Prophets are of good cheer because they know the plan. They know who wins in the end. As Sister Holland has said so beautifully, the ability to see the world positively is yet another gift from God. Men, and I might add women and children, are that they might have joy. The scriptures are wont to tell us. That is why it is a plan of happiness. As a result of that plan and Christ's atonement at the heart of it, we can be hopeful no matter how dark some days may be. The grandeur of the Savior's example in this matter deserves our reverence as we face a new year, a year that might hold some challenges for some of us. Think about it. How could Jesus speak of cheerfulness in the midst of all the anguish that he faced moving toward the crucifixion. Even in that fateful atmosphere that must have prevailed at the Last Supper in the middle of Passion Week, Christ is still reminding his disciples of the reason for and their duty to be of good cheer. I've wondered, with the pain that lay ahead of him, how could he speak so positively and expect his brethren to view all of this so buoyantly? Surely this manifestation of his faith, of his hope and charity, comes because he knows the end of the story. He knows righteousness prevails when final accounts are completed. He knows that light always conquers darkness forever and forever and forever. He knows his Father in heaven never gives a commandment without also providing the way to fulfill it. A victory makes everyone cheerful, and Christ was the victor in the great contest with death and with hell. Now that's heavy theology tonight, but that's what they were to be happy about. Christ triumphant is the source of our hope 
in this new year and every year forever. Given life's distractions and Lucifer's temptations, staying hopeful and cheerful tomorrow or next month or next year may be difficult. Nevertheless, that was precisely Sister Holland's point in asking for simplification and a tenacious focus on the basics of Latter-day Saint life. Sometimes we stay focused on them voluntarily, and sometimes life does it for us. But in either case, if we've built our testimonies on the fundamentals of the gospel, we can get as much from our challenging experiences as a respected friend of mine is currently getting from his. He, his wife, and his daughter, and I believe they're listening tonight, are all experiencing a variety of health challenges, very serious challenges, I should add. <clears throat> there is every reason for them to throw their hands in the air and wonder what good their hope or their faith or their charity have done them. But because of determined discipleship in times of both joy or sorrow, this family is prevailing. In a recent email, which I share with you by his permission, my friend wrote, Over the last few months, my world has become very small, the size of a hospital bed or perhaps a sick room. My wife's recovery after her kidney transplant has proven to be difficult, and she has spent the last month in and out and in and out of the hospital. As a result, I have unplugged from much of the world around me. Think of the world's simplicity. He continues, I've never liked the idea that the Lord gives us trials, but I do believe he can use trials for his purposes. One thing that has been brought home to me over the last few weeks is how important and real the heart of the gospel is, as opposed to so much that can be superfluous. The experience of love for others, the experience of being loved and served by others, the quiet presence of God's voice as you sit exhausted by a sick child's bed or a desperately ill wife's hospital room late at night and hear the divine phrase, peace be to thy soul, my son. I've read the Book of Mormon, he goes on, and the Gospels, and I've felt God's love. Beyond the scaffolding of the church and beyond abstract theology, the things that can help us crawl toward the light are the reality of faith testimony, hope, and love. He concludes, I've been unable to attend sacrament meeting for weeks now, but I've seen so many good people who've been true to their covenants serving my family. I am so blessed by so much, and I love the Lord. I love the gospel. I love the restoration. And I love the church. Well, that eloquent testimonial of hope and perseverance and faith and charity expressed in the very midst of a most difficult time is moving to me. And we need to know that at some point, 
our hopes and our convictions will undoubtedly be tested and refined in a similar crucible of personal suffering as well. My beautiful young friends, untested faith isn't much faith at all. We say we're built upon the rock of Christ. Well, we'd better be because life has its storms and its squalls, and a sandy foundation simply will not hold when the wind blows and the rain descends and those floods come. One last comment as we move toward conclusion of this worldwide broadcast in a wonderful new year, including a new institute year. <clears throat> Some of you out there may be worried about things more serious than which course to take in school or what professional career you should pursue. Some of you may be wrestling with the burden of guilt, and nothing so damages and deflates our hope and brings greater alienation from God than transgression brings. Sister Holland and I have consciously not chosen to make this a talk about sin or transgression, but we would be irresponsible not to touch on what the Lord has said it is our obligation to teach. There will always be a universal need for the hope-filled principle and marvelous practice of repentance. When we have transgressed, when we know exactly why our flame of hope flickers and why sometimes it seems to have gone out, in such a condition, we have to change or our hope for a cheerful future is doomed. That candle is permanently out. That's why all of us have need to repent continually, all of us. Every day, President Nelson has said. So I ask you tonight to deal with the, the burden of transgression immediately, starting this hour. Sin being the greatest enemy of hope and happiness that I know of in all the world. Go before the Lord with your confession and go before the bishop if your sin requires it. But change whatever is wrong, large or small. Repentance is the way we get a fresh start. It's the way we get an elevated future. Life is difficult enough without carrying a pack of mistakes on your back all day, every day, all night, every night. Unload that. Change anxiety for peace. Change sorrow for some happiness. Christ gave his very life in order that you could be free to do that. Then you can do as Nephi asks us all to do in what is essentially his valedictory message shortly before his death. This son, who saw so much of conflict and contention, says what Sister Holland and I have wanted and tried to say tonight, press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope. Press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and all men. That brightness of hope, born of love for God and all men, that's what we want for every one of you in a new year. Accompanying that bright hope will be the undeniable whisper 
that God loves you, that Christ is your advocate, that the gospel is true. Its brightness will remind you that in the gospel there is always, every day, every hour, a new chance, a new life, a new year. What a miracle. What a gift. And because of Christ's gift, the best things in life are ours if we steadfastly keep believing and keep trying and keep hoping. You remember those global conditions I talked about as we began? Well, face them and face your personal challenges, knowing that with faith things work out in the end. Refuse to accept the world for what it appears to be. Shine the brightness of your hope on it and make it what it ought to be. Be that light Sister Holland had asked for you to be, a light never to be extinguished, the light of the Savior of the world. I leave an apostolic blessing on each one of you tonight for this new year. Regarding things I know with certainty and things you will always need, I do so out of my love for you, the Lord's love for you, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve's love for you, everybody's love and your attendance here tonight. I bless you that the simple but exquisite power inherent in the principles of salvation, such as faith and hope and charity, will always be evident and efficacious in your life. I bless you to know, as I most assuredly do, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is personally precious, everlastingly hopeful, and eternally true. I testify with apostolic authority that that is so, and as such is the only unfailing answer to life's many challenges, yours and mine, the only way to be exalted in the grandeur of eternity. I bless any among you who might be speaking these days of a faith crisis. Real faith, life-changing faith, Abrahamic faith is always in crisis. That's how you find out if it's faith at all. I promise you, that more faith will mean less crisis until finally God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I bless every single solitary one of you to know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is exactly that, the Church of Jesus Christ and that only through the ordinances and opportunities it provides can one fully come under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I bless each one of you individually and by name with every gift you need for this quest. And I bless you, plead with you to patiently persevere as your Father in heaven, in his wisdom, finds the best way to frequently give you what you ask, but unfailingly give you what you need. Of God's divine love, of the Savior's eternal advocacy in our behalf, of the Holy Ghost's constant comfort, of the power of the holy priesthood, 
of the prophetic tradition currently personified in President Russell M. Nelson, of the divinity of the Book of Mormon, and of the perfect brightness of hope this gospel gives, I bear solemn and sacred and personal witness on my life. I do so in the name of him who is the source of all my hope, even the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity we've had to hear from Elder and Sister Holland and to hear from Thee and to hear from the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask Thee to bless us with the Spirit and with the remembrance of the things that we have learned and the things that we have been prompted to do and feel. We ask Thee to bless us with the gift of hope, to bless us with a stronger relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as we strive to obtain one. And we ask thee to bless us to see ways to simplify our lives and act in ways that will give us more hope. Father, we love thee 
and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.